and loves. For I do not seek to understand that I may believe, but I believe in order to understand. For this also I believe, that unless I believed, I should not understand. End quote. Now, let me just read that last sentence again. Quote, For I do not seek to understand that I may believe, but I believe in order to understand. For this also I believe, that unless I believed, I should not understand. End quote. So that's the beginning of chapter 2 of the Proslogion. So you can see there, the chapter really does begin as a prayer to God. And Anselm states that, that famous phrase there, that he does not seek to understand so that he may believe, but he already believes in order to understand. Now, our modern sensibilities tells us that Anselm has it backwards. For many people, skepticism is the default position. So they begin with skepticism, and they're not willing to believe until you persuade them until you persuade their understanding. So skepticism comes first, according to many modern people, and only once you've convinced their understanding would they be willing to believe. Anselm, however, states it in the opposite. He states it backwards. He says, I don't seek to understand that I may believe, but I first believe in order to understand. So for Anselm, belief comes first. And once we've established our belief or faith, then we seek to understand it. Then we seek to apply reason to that which we formerly believed. Now, it's because of this passage here that I'm not absolutely convinced that Anselm intends this to be an argument. For based upon this reading, it would appear that unless you first have faith, you really can't understand what he's about to say. So it's possible, according to my reading here, that Anselm is constructing this quote-unquote argument for believers only, and that an unbeliever will never be able to grasp the true merit of of what he's about ready to say. Now that's a controversial interpretation. Others may disagree, but it would appear that if we read the text closely, I think there's good evidence to support it. Nonetheless, we'll go forward as if the as if Anselm is presenting this as an argument here, and, and we'll see if we can make sense of it. The ontological argument is known as a perfect being argument. And what that means is that once he establishes the existence of God, every perfection conceivable will be included in God's existence. So it's really, I mean, if you're a person of faith, it's really a great, a great deal here because not only do you get God's existence, but you also get a perfect being who exists. Whereas we'll see in the next lecture on the cosmological argument, it may establish that God exists, but there's no guarantee that the being who it does establish contains all the perfections that we commonly want to associate with God. One assumption, real quick, before we turn to the next slide, that Anselm makes is that perfection implies existence, or that the greatest conceivable being must exist in reality and not simply in the mind. And this will be a major assumption that Immanuel Kant, centuries later, calls into question, this idea that perfection implies existence. So we'll begin with, quote-unquote, argument one, which is found in chapter two, and this is the version that you have in your textbook, so you should be somewhat familiar with this. 
So I've done my best to break it down into different steps. I'll go through it line by line, see if we can make sense of it. First off, number one here, the definition that Anselm gives for God is very important to understanding the overall argument. Notice here how he states it. He says that God is a being than which nothing greater can be conceived. So he's stating this in the negative as opposed to the positive. And what I mean by negative is not that it's bad or it's morally wrong, but it's stated in a way that doesn't imply that human beings really grasp what it means to be God. He's saying God is a being in which nothing greater can be conceived. So there's nothing higher than God. He's not saying that we have a glimpse of what it means to be God, for clearly Anselm would think that would be absurd. This idea that a human mind can somehow penetrate the divine essence. Anselm would hold nothing of the sort. But really what he's pointing out and what he's getting to is negative theology. He's saying what God is not. God is a being in which nothing greater can be conceived. And by conceived, he simply means understood. So let's work with that definition. Number two, to say that a being in which nothing greater can be conceived exists only in the mind is absurd. So if you notice in the text, Anselm quotes Psalm 14.1, or 13.1, which says that the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Now, what Anselm's doing here is this. Even for an atheist to deny that God exists, the atheist still has to have an idea of God. Right? So in order for me to deny that God exists, I first have to have an idea of the being that I'm denying. Now, this is where that definition of God comes in, in point number one. If God really is a being in which nothing greater can be conceived, Anselm thinks it's ultimately absurd to say that this being only exists in the mind. Because, point number three, existence in reality is greater than existence in the mind. Obviously, if we're talking about something existing, we would have to say that it's great, according to Anselm, we have to say it's greater to exist in reality than simply to exist in the mind. Existence in reality is greater than existence in the mind. Point number four. We can conceive of a being greater than one that exists only in the mind, namely a being that also exists in reality. So if the person who's denying that God exists, if they're truly thinking of a being in which nothing greater can be conceived, they would have to conclude that it's possible that there could be a being greater than the one they're thinking of, in which case they wouldn't be conceiving of a being in which nothing greater can be thought or conceived. But point number five, there can be no being greater than a being which nothing greater can be conceived. Therefore, point number six, God exists. Now notice here that this argument is completely a priori in nature. It doesn't rely upon experience. It doesn't rely upon perception, observation. It doesn't rely upon a scientific experiment. It simply derives the existence of God from the idea of God. Now, at first, you're probably thinking, well, this argument, there's just something wrong here. It's like a, a trick that a magician is playing on you. Right? It's kind of an illusion. And it's real easy to dismiss it when you first encounter it. Out of hand is right, nothing more than a 
parlor trick. But I think if you really break it down step by step, like I've done here on the screen, thinking about each part, it really is quite compelling. Right? I'm not saying it works or that it's valid, but it is forceful. It is powerful. I mean, the argument's almost been around now for a thousand years, and philosophers continue to deal with it and work on it and struggle with it. So there has to be some.